All right. Hey, everybody. I'm Thomas. I am part of Dior, and we are a DAO that's focused on building development, uh, like technical and legal infrastructure for uh, DAOs in the ecosystem. I'm going to talk about a bit about a potential future fundraising mechanism for DAOs uh, based on the token bonding curve model. I'm also going to take my backpack off. I'm not sure why I have that on stage. A bit closer? All right, yeah, thanks. Um, so what originally inspired us down this path of exploration is thinking about a way that DAOs or like decentralized organizations can fund themselves in a way that it aligns incentives across like the different parties involved, like the investors, the founders, and the participants of all stripes. Um, so inspired by the work of people such as uh, Simon De La Rue, Billy Renenkamp, and the continuous organization model, the core of our approach to better fundraising is based on the token bonding curve model. And as I go into more detail of that, I want to talk about kind of a pertinent real life example use case of this which is uh, the DX DAO, it's live, and it may want to find ways to raise money to, in order to facilitate its future visions, which may include uh, both its administrative costs, doing things like community engagement and marketing, and uh, development of different protocols and dApps, as is probably its vision forward. So the existing solutions all kind of have limitations. Uh, so I'll just mention something like a traditional equity raise, even though that isn't necessarily viable in this case. Um, this has problems of both the like technical and legal flexibility of distribution of equity and also as in, uh, investor incentive alignment problems and that people like VCs may have a different vision for the future of the organization than the core participants in the DAO. Uh, there's also an ICO type of model. Uh, this works better for the flexibility, uh, distribution of equity, uh, but it has issues in terms of what utility you provide the investors beyond a speculative asset, and as well as ma maintaining liquidity and market price. You have to have exchanges for that, and it can be quite volatile, as we've seen in the past. Uh, you can also forego fundraising altogether and focus on using the existing revenue, which currently is for the fees from the Dutch X exchange. Uh, but this level of slow organic growth might not meet the needs and has a hard time like onboarding new people into the DXL community and getting them excited. So meet the bonded token here, this interesting icon. Uh, what this is, just a normal ERC-20 token that is distributed by an automated market maker that gives holders rights to future cash flows and revenue from the DXDAO's ventures. So that it has those two components, which I'll go into kind of separately. Uh, so the bonding curve is the automated market maker. Um, if you're not familiar with how this works, this bonding curve contract here can mint and burn tokens uh, in response to buys or sells. And the current price is algorithmically determined by the number of existing tokens, such that you know later investors pay more. And it also provides a guarantee of liquidity because like all, all the purchases, all that money that's used to purchase it stays in the curve, and this is used to facilitate sells. So, you know, that, that's cool, but how does fundraising fit in if we're just creating this automated market maker? The answer for that is by introducing a spread to this market. So now you'll have a separate buy and sell curve, whereas the sell curve is lower than the buy curve. And when buys happen, the income is distributed between the Dow's treasury, which is represented by the bank vault, and the reserve. So it's split between these according to a parameter. And this is heavily inspired by the continuation organization, continuous organization uh, vision. I recommend reading that white paper if you're interested. Uh, so let's make its example a little more concrete and say this like extraterrestrial wants to invest in the DX DAO. So it, we would specify a collateral token when we deploy this model and we say, say it's DAI. So they send in DAI, they receive bonded tokens in accordance to the current algorithmically determined price, and that money is distributed between the DAO and the reserve. And then on sells, it works much the same way, except for with the lower curve. You can send in bonded tokens at any time and have guaranteed liquidity according to the current price. So now we have this token that's distributed continuously via an automated market maker. And these sales fund the DAO while creating investors with a solidly linked incentive to the success of the DAO because they kind of are earning rights on the future cash flow as well as having the speculative potential of the asset. So there's a few interesting issues here, one of which is how do we handle the rights to future cash flow? 
So at a basic level, what happens is when the DAO receives revenue, that revenue is distributed according to a preset parameter between the bonded token holders in aggregate and the DAO itself. Uh, so a big challenge, this was probably the big technical challenge of this project, is finding a way to do scalable distributions of these rewards on Ethereum, given the current computational limitations. Uh, so we have a couple schemes on this way. The current one that's implemented is this Merkle tree-based approach. Whereas it works very conceptually to a stock dividend in the traditional world, there's every set period, a snapshot is taken of the token balances and revenue and kind of made into a Merkle tree. And then this root is published by a DAO member, which allows all the token holders during that period to make their, their claims uh, using a, a pull model, which solves a pretty cheap uh, gas cost as well. Uh, this model has some limitations, obviously, in that it requires the DAO to take action and it requires kind of trust that they're uploading the proper thing. Um, we generally believe that this won't be an issue in practice um, because it's not necessarily a deviation from the trust assumption in that they're trusting the DAO with their investment to begin with. So they, that kind of implies trust that they will continue to operate according to their agreements. Um, and that the DAO would generally choose to maintain its reputation and the price of its asset rather than exit scam within a single dividend period. Of course, there are, there are still the four stated problems here. So we now have, believe we have a purely on-chain implementation that avoids the excessive gas concerns with other past implementations and will avoid these concerns as well. But I'm not gonna go too in-depth into that until it is fully implemented. But that's a pretty exciting development, so. Uh, then there's the, the curve itself. Uh, there's a lot of discussion along this area, and so we've chosen to make a fairly generic implementation. The first thing we're supporting is the Bancor formula-based curves, which allows a pretty flexible curve parameters with very simple, with a single parameter, actually, you can come with a pretty wide variety of schemes. Um, however, yeah, these calculations aren't baked into the market maker. This is kind of a modular part. So we allow for theoretically any type of curve to be used as kind of the, the lines of thinking go forward in this area. A big part is also integration into DAO platforms. So the DX DAO is a DAO stack DAO, and to that end we have developed a front end within the DAO stack Alchemy interface. And this would work just like the existing things. People can make proposals in there, interact with bonding curves, deploy bonding curves, all from a familiar interface. Um, some other interesting considerations is front running. This is a problem with decentralized exchanges of all stripes in general. And we have some interesting thoughts along these lines. These are different approaches that can be used. We currently use uh, limits on orders such that if the price changes significantly from what you expect it to be, you can have the order fail. Uh, there also is a potential to limit gas costs uh, so that by having this fixed, you can limit the potential of front running by making it more random what's chosen first. There's also a transaction batching approach such as kind of similar to the Dutch X exchange. In the future, we expect that things will be done in a more limited knowledge fashion, maybe with zero knowledge proofs, or you could even do this with commit and reveal schemes such that order information is hidden, which makes front running difficult. Some future potential features of this tool set are things like token vesting and to token hatching, which that means that like you, once you buy tokens from the curve, you can't spend them immediately. And this helps you know, prevent pumping and dumping and create some alignment of incentives among the longer term. Hatching just means that you only have vesting among the earlier buyers and like the vesting period kind of diminishes over time as more and more people buy. Uh, there's also an idea some people like is token locking for governance rights, whereas you can trade, you can lock up the tokens, the bonded tokens you've got for governance power in the DAO. Um, Multi-collateral reserves are interesting, as opposed to having one currency used in the reserve. This can help with the kind of uh, distribution of assets in there. Uh, diversification might help valuation. I mean, we think stable coins will be prominent here anyway. Um, also, potential of administration of the curve post-deployment, such as the DAO could change the curve implementation if thing if kind of its assumptions are in incorrect. And these are all configurable. These would all be like configurable things that a DAO would choose. Also, KYC whitelisting may be interesting. Things like the TPL protocol would enable this on a purely on-chain way. Uh, so, in summary, we the 
continuous fundraising model we have is based on the bonding curves, and you can use this to fund fundraise for your DAO and offer investors rights to future cash flow and with a scalable distribution. Um, if you're interested in joining the conversation, you can follow this link on Telegram. And I wanted to give a shout out to Gnosis, who made this entire thing possible uh, through their ecosystem grants program. Uh, they've been a real pleasure to work with, and they're currently accepting applications for their next wave of grants. And also Dorg, uh, we're looking to onboard more people as we grow. You know, developers, designers, biz dev folks, sales community. Um, so come check out our website at dorg.tech if you're potentially interested in getting involved, and we're happy to talk as well. And uh, yeah, I can take questions. Thanks. Yeah, there's a second mic. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, just pop up your hand if you've got questions. I'll start at the front because it's close. Hi, thanks. Great talk. Um, just maybe to clarify again how you handle these interest payments for the um, the DAO token holders. So you, at specific intervals, take a snapshot of the distribution of the tokens, uh, hash that, and then how do you prove that at a later time, let's say I want to withdraw my interests from the pool, how do I know or how can I prove that I actually received at these intervals, I had this stake and that uh, such an amount of interest was allocated to me at different intervals. So how does the proving mechanism there work? Uh, sure, yeah, I, I didn't, I kind of neglected to go into that. Well, the, the roots of this Merkle tree are published on chain for each interval. And then the, the full set of data involved is published to IPFS. And that's kind of assumption is that the DAO will maintain that data set uh, for every distribution period such that you can improve it. Uh, in this case, the, the existence of the proof, you can just submit that to the smart contract and it can verify any proof for any user's allocation. So once the initial root is published, uh, anyone can withdraw on their own terms without any more human involvement. They have to, they input like what they're wanting to claim and the proof that shows that they're allowed to claim that amount. Next question, feel free to say where you're from if you'd like. Thanks again for the talk. Um, had a quick question on the, on the spreads. So what's the range that you foresee between the buy and sell curves? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know that we necessarily foresee any range. Um, I've seen people having discussions, you know, all the way from the low end to the high end. Some people have even postulated that there is no sell curve and using it purely as a fundraising mechanism. And some people want it to be something more like maybe like 10, 15% of mm -hmm. the buy value. Uh, it's totally modular within our system. So we're not opinionated as to what parameters people want to choose, and we feel like it's an area of very like active research and development. Uh huh. Because the, the the question, I guess, behind the question was, if I'm an investor, right, and I buy something for a hundred dollars, and I can sell it immediately for eighty five dollars, why would I do that, right? So there has to be some some really interesting expectations of ROI in in the future, because immediately you're 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 de um, debasing the what, what you just put into the into mm -hmm. the DAO, right? Yeah, yeah, you would have an expectation of future returns either as a speculative asset that more people will buy and you'll be able to sell higher along the curve, which you would get a better price than your original investment or ex expectation of the future cash flow uh, improving that. Anyone else that had a question? I have one. Um, <laughs> How do you see the landscape of DAOs and people playing with implementations of token bonding curves? Like you said, it's an act, like definitely things around like liquidity and valuation are active areas of research. But what's going to be the difference between Dorg and other implementers in this space? Uh, so as far as I'm aware, we're the only implementation that is focused on this kind of continuous organization inspired token bonding curve model. Uh, I believe Aragon Black is another big one that is currently focused on more of a, a DICO model, uh, where you have an ICO and then the funds, instead of being distributed to the people, the uh, members all at once are kind of distributed according to this TAP, which is like a, a burn rate that, that is approved by the token holders who can vote to change that burn rate. So yeah, there are some different implementations going on. Uh, it's, it's very exciting, uh, but I believe we're the only actual implementation for this specific 
type. If there's no one else that has questions, we'll uh, thank Thomas for the presentation. And I'm looking for a Jorge, if anyone has seen them, at the back. Oh, a question? Fantastic. Your curves are based on uh, bonding curve, on the Bancor curve, right? Mm -hmm. OK, do you plan on switching on these because these are pretty inaccurate? Uh, so the Bancor curve we just thought was an interesting one to provide some flexibility for an initial implementation. We, we have designed the code in such a way that the actual curve logic is modular. So we're definitely interested in implementing other types of curves going forward, depending on what people are interested in and what has like solid audited math on solidity. And do you plan on having um, closed or do you have closed functions in your uh, continuous organizations? Do we have a, what, what type of function? Closed functions. Closed functions. Yeah. Pretty, being able to tear it down. Being able to tear it down. Uh, we do not currently have that implemented, though it would be you know a fairly straightforward thing to implement. 